Um, I will introduce uh, Dr. Whittingham, Stan, in a moment, and he will go ahead and, and give us about 10 to 15 minutes of an overview of um, his experience, his research, what he's done. I know we have quite a uh, mixed audience this morning, so we want to welcome all of our admitted students. If you've been admitted for the fall 2020 session, we're really excited for you. Some of our students here may be juniors or sophomores in high school still wondering what to do and, and looking into your options, so we're really excited to have you joining us. And any parents out there, um, just we thank you for coming on this morning, and we hope you get a lot out of this too. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce Stan here. And um, so Dr. Stan Whittingham is here. He's going to be telling us about his research about the lithium ion batteries and, and kind of what led him to it and, and his story. And then, of course, there'll be a chance to ask questions via the Q&A at the end. Um, and after the Q&A, we're going to just talk to Stan a little bit about what it means to be with Bing through all of this. So um, without further ado, I'm going to let you take it away, Stan. Thank you, Kerry. And welcome, everybody. Um, students, parents, and others. I want to give you a little bit of background first about me, and then a little bit about batteries, then something on education. So on the bottom of this slide, you'll see my background. That's, I'm, Sure, you can judge that I'm not American by birth, but I've been an American more than longer than most of the students who attend Binghamton. Um, so I went to high school in England at Stanford, then to Oxford, then spent four years at Stanford. And then I joined industry for 15 or so years before coming to Binghamton. And I just show you here a few pictures from Stockholm just give you an impression of what it's like. And people ask about the young lady in the middle. That's an annual event. And yes, they're real candles and the real flames. And the princess on the right, turns out she lives in Miami, Florida. So let's look at, at batteries. Um, Exxon, or was then Esso, um, built the first batteries, and I show you one on the left there, which was a, a large lithium battery, which went to Electric Vehicle Show back in 1977. So there was a lot of interest back in the 70s. And on the right is a, a marketing giveaway that Exxon built. This has a battery at the top left, and then a, a watch and a little solar cell. This particular one is still on my desk and it's still working. So a good lithium ion battery lasts a very long time. And it turns out we found a few of these old batteries. And here's a similar one to on that previous slide, plus a tiny one that might go inside, say a watch. And these are now in the Nobel Museum in Stockholm. So if you ever go there, you can see these. And behind that is the marketing brochure from Exxon at that time. So that's the beginning. If you look now a few months ago, here's a few examples of where lithium batteries are today. At the top left is my wife and I. We spent our 50th anniversary in Bermuda last March. And Bermuda had just imported their first electric vehicles and tourists are now allowed to drive vehicles provided they're electric. And as we found out, range anxiety is real. You have to be very careful to recharge them before you run out of electricity. And the other two top pictures are from um, Peterbilt trucks out in Washington state. And we visited them last October and I had the chance of driving these trucks around their test track. And you can see the first one's a 16 wheeler. You can see all the big batteries there. And the second one is a all electric garbage truck. So that's where the industry is going. People, I think, didn't think um, big trucks would be electric, but these are really short haul trucks, delivering materials safe from the docks to a distribution center, not crossing the country. At the bottom, all of you have at least one smartphone, a smartwatch, so everybody's got at least one lithium battery. 
But the other key use of lithium batteries is for renewable energy. So if you've got solar, you need to store the energy. If you've got wind, you need to store it. And in the center at the bottom is, I think, a 16 megawatt hour battery facility in West Virginia. The one next to that that says NEC is a large battery facility um, just south of Saratoga Springs in New York State. It's next to a substation. They buy the electricity in the early hours of the morning and sell it back to the utilities at the peak hours in the daytime. And they're making money now. At the bottom right is a storage facility that used to be in Binghamton. Um, it, it was put next to a coal power plant and within six months they turned off the coal power plant permanently. The batteries did the job. Um, about two years later, they took all these batteries to Ohio because they could make more money. So lithium batteries are very flexible and that's one of their advantages. The other big thing that's happening whilst we're in Stockholm, the space station was switching over totally to lithium ion batteries. And the lady on the left whose mother is Swedish, you can see the Swedish flag on the jacket, was born in Maine, here in um, the States. And she and another female astronaut were the ones responsible for installing all the lithium batteries on the outside the space station. And they liked lithium ion because they could use half the number and they last twice as long. And they give a very interesting display of how they do things there. And it's all on the Nobel site if you want to see more. One thing students can do, and we encourage, I should say, I'm a professor in chemistry and material science. We have a number of students who like to go international. And this, we have this Erasmus Mundus program in Europe. So students get a bachelor's degree in the US. Then they go into Europe for 18 months, take courses in three different countries. And at the end of that, they'll have a master's degree in materials energy. And this was a group of students who drove from Warsaw to be at the Nobel meeting. And they're all within this program. So one of my undergraduates went to this program. Then he went to Chicago for his PhD. And he liked it so much, he's now back in Spain at a battery facility there. You've probably all done this in school. I don't know whether it's middle school or high school. This was a group of fourth graders that the British ambassador invited in to build these um, nickel zinc batteries, the original Volta batteries. And they were all successful in making them and they were lighting up little diodes. So the British ambassador was very enthused. Um, she brought two electric vehicles from London, a Jaguar and a London taxi, plus had this group of students come in and demonstrate batteries. The other thing that's very active in Sweden, and I think it's, we do it to some extent on this campus, is um, have science programs which help startup companies get high school students involved in science. And this is one that's in Kista Science City. And the two of us, winners of the lithium battery are in the middle there. And we spent about two hours at this facility talking to the students so they would understand what it was all about and getting them enthused so they would go to school and take science on for their major. So there's really, I think, three messages I want to give all the students here. If you go into science, really there's boundaries these days, for example, between chemistry, physics, and engineering. You're going to need to take classes in all one of those, all, all of those, and understand the different lingos they speak. Okay. 
science is also international. So at Binghamton, if you come to the university, you'll find many foreign scientists, many foreign faculty. And if you do research in our labs, you'll work with students from all around the world. There are essentially no barriers these days. So what this means is, first, you're all spoiled because the language of science is English now. When I was brought up, it was German, but if you go to a science meeting in Japan, China, Germany, the entire meeting will be English. But you still need to really understand the cultures of the other people. So I recommend you do take some um, classes in the languages so you understand how the Asians think. They don't think the same way as we do. Um, I already mentioned that um, lithium batteries enabled the electronics revolution. Now, without lithium batteries, you would not have your iPhones and other devices. And I think the clear thing these days is if we have energy storage, we can have renewable energy. And New York State has a target of going to 50 or 60 percent renewable within the next 10 to 15 years. So we'll have a cleaner environment. Hopefully we'll have a more sustainable technology and we'll start recycling all your gadgets. Roughly 80% I gather of iPhones get tossed either into the garbage or into your top drawer and never looked at again. And they should assist in mitigating global warming. And I prefer to call this global messing up because you ex have extremes both on the hot end and the cold end. And as I showed with the battery storage system in Binghamton, it's going to give us a more efficient um, electric grid. The other point I want to make is um, I'm a scientist, facts mat matter. So we're going to emphasize, I think, to you, get the, let's get the facts right and let's um, rely on scientists to give us the truth. And if you want to know what works and what really doesn't work in real life, read a book or two of the Nobel winners in economics. They were in education in poor countries and everything they thought was obvious wasn't. And everything they thought was um, going to work didn't. So there's a lot of learnings there. Um, if you come to Binghamton, you can come and visit my labs. It's in what we call the, the um, Center of Excellence. This is a group of three or four buildings, brand new buildings, just across the street from the main campus. And this is where some of the science classes are and essentially all the science was research in the physical sciences and in most of engineering. What I want to leave you with a, a few messages. We're going to help you think, help you learn. So I think it's very important we teach you how to learn for yourselves. We're not going to tell you how to recite back what we gave you. And I think we want to make sure you keep your imagination. So I have a quote there from Albert Einstein. Imagination is more important than knowledge. These days you can look up knowledge on the internet. We need you know, new ideas, a lot of smart new ideas. And this is why the owl and the lamp is there. That's probably most of you know the incandescent lamp's only about 5% efficient. So welcome to Binghamton. Enjoy yourself and we faculty are here to help you all. Thank you and I'll try to answer any questions you've got. Thank you so much, Stan. This was really, really great. Um, I think we've got some questions already. I might start by talking about uh, what research you're currently doing and can you talk about maybe your work with first year students? So what, you know, where do you, where did you go after, you know, all of the, the lithium ion research and, and how does that fit into what you're doing now and with your students at Binghamton? So I, I switched back to this picture here. So we get a lot of money from the United States Department of Energy. Um, we have what we call Energy Frontier Research Center. So this does fundamental research into better battery materials, store more energy, be safer and lower cost. 
We also have another pro large project with the Department of Energy to double the energy density of today's batteries. So that will also reduce the cost. We also have the capability one floor down from this picture to actually make batteries at the university. So we have a large dry room and a prototype manufacturing site. So we're still very active. Typically in any year we'll have one high school student in the group, two or three undergraduates in the group. Right now there's about six graduate students and three staff members. So students can get involved, I wouldn't say necessarily in their first year. The first year there's a what we call a freshman research immersion program that some students get into. So they'll do some research in the first year, but we encourage students from the summer after the first year to get into the research activities. The most chemistry majors and physics majors will do some research for their degree. Thank you. Um, so we have some questions here as well about the safety of lithium batteries and the long-term environmental benefits versus concerns. So could you maybe speak to both sides of that? Um, if you store energy, it is by definition unsafe. Okay, so you got energy, it's going to try to release it. So um, lithium batteries are, I think, very safe. I, I showed you um, those batteries that were about 40 years old, 45 years old, they're still good. Um, there may be some parents or grandparents on this program who've got um, pacemakers. Those are lithium batteries. So they last typically 10 or 15 years. Um, there's very few accidents now with, with batteries. Just make sure you don't buy cheap Chinese knockoffs because every lithium battery has electronics in it to make sure it stays safe. Some of the cheap knockoffs, if they're cheap, they don't have that protection inside them. Um, if you have auto accidents, whether it's gasoline or batteries, there's a hazard there. But um, my understanding is Tesla's built in about 10 minutes. It'll warn you if there's something's going wrong until you've got 10 minutes to get out of the vehicle and get away from it which is more than you have with a gasoline fire. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the future as well. We have a qu couple of questions here. Um, do you think there's a future in solid state batteries and what direction do you see the field progressing um, to improve the rate capabilities of electrode materials? So those kind of you know, future type questions related right. to, to the batteries. So I was on another um, Zoom call right before this call with Benchmark Minerals. They had a supply chain discussion of oil versus batteries. And the consensus they have in it, the group of mine, um, solid state batteries are coming. You're not really gonna see them large scale into, until the 2030s. There's some real challenges there. Two of them are related, can you get high rates in solid state across the boundaries? And the other one is, can you make solid state batteries at low cost? The cost of making lithium iron right now is extremely low. You're making gigawatt hours of them each year. So the manufacturing has got low cost. Solid state may have some challenges, but I visited Applied Materials just six weeks ago, and they are developing techniques for making solid state batteries right now in California. That's great. Um, so for a follow-up to that, Stan, is, do you think there's a future in recovering or recycling lithium? Um, I would rephrase the question. Uh, so do you think there is a way that, that you could, oh, are you going to rephrase yeah. the question? Oh, so, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So the value in the lithium-ion batteries is mostly the cobalt and then the nickel. And lithium comes along for the ride, as it were. So, so long as there's nickel and cobalt there, there's a huge incentive for recycling. There's a recycling facility in Buffalo. There's, about, there's one about to start up in Rochester. And there's a, shall we say, discussion over in Endicott, right across the river from Binghamton, about starting a recycling facility 
in the old IBM facility facilities there. So people will start recycling batteries more. Um, there was a fire maybe a few months ago in a you know, regular garbage facility, had plastics and paper in it, and apparently a, a smartphone got in there, got crushed and set the whole building on fire. So people are looking out very carefully now to make sure all lithium batteries are recycled and not tossed because there is a lot of value in them. And I expect the largest cobalt deposits these days may be in garbage dumps. So I, I might follow up with that, Stan. We have a question about the, the, the kind of the catching on fire as well. Um, do you think you could speak to about uh, the few years ago, the Samsung phone batteries that were overheating and catching on fire? Uh, maybe you could help explain the cause of that? It's called culture. So um, as I understand it, Samsung management went to their engineers and said, Apple's coming out with a new phone. You've got to put 30% more energy density into this phone coming out. And the engineers wouldn't say, no, it can't be done. So they did it. They put about 30% more capacity in the same space. Batteries expand a bit as they cycled. So when these were cycled, they got crushed internally, shorted the cells out. And it didn't matter whether they were Samsung cells or cells made in China, it was the same design issue. So I think they've learned, listen to your engineers, don't tell them what to do. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one more question about kind of the research side of things, and then we have some questions about academia and, and life at Binghamton. So um, you mentioned how science is surely interdisciplinary. Uh, how blurry are the lines between physics and chemistry on the cutting edge of research? Um, let's say my center that I run, we're probably at one third chemists, one third physicists, and one third engineers. So they work totally together. So my graduate students and undergraduates who are really chemists will work hand in hand with the physicists. So they'll be in a lab together, talking to each other. So if you're in materials science, it you know, basically covers physics, chemistry, and engineering. So they're blurred. If you're in nuclear physics, that's something different. But in, when you're talking about solids, there was no barrier really between the disciplines anymore. Thank you. Um, so as we transition into academia, I'm going to open it up. We have a question from a, a sophomore in high school here who is the co-founder of his school's Environmental Awareness and Climate Change Club. So you talked about sustainable energy. What do you think is the best way that high schools around the country can contribute to clean energy? And have you done any examples using science to show students the effect of clean versus unclean energy? I, I think... Um... Clean versus unclean energy, you just need to go on the internet today. Look at New Delhi, look at China, look at Venice. No people, no ocean liners, no cars. There's a blue sky and fish in all the canals in Venice. So there's a huge difference. It, the two advantages if we go to clean energy. One, it makes the environment cleaners, so it solves our health problems. It also um, will solve um, global warming to some extent. So I know in China itself, what they call two wheelers, motorcycles, mopeds, they have to be all electric now. And when I was in Vietnam a year ago, they were also converting from gasoline two wheelers to all electric two wheelers. So I think you're going to see that. And for folks living in New York City, my betting is within 10 years, all vehicles within, say, Manhattan will be all electric. They'll be cleaner. And the message I'd give to students, um, conserve energy. That's the easiest way to go cleaner. And what amazes me today, if I drive around, everybody is in their own car. When I worked for Exxon, we lived about seven miles from the company. We carpooled every day, four of us, and everybody did that same thing. When I lived in California, in the Bay Area, none of the homes had air conditioning. Now every, every home has air conditioning. So I think we've got spoiled. We want everything. 
and we don't look at what the consequences of that are. Thank you, Stan. Um, so you, you mentioned working for Exxon, uh, and we have a question. Could, could you speak to the differences between working in industry versus working in academia, where you are now? Um, that's a difficult one, because you have to look at the time scale. So when I was at Exxon in the 1970s, it was probably easier to do fundamental outstanding research, say in Exxon or in Bell Labs or DuPont or General Electric where they all had corporate research labs, they had lots of money, and they invested in research for the future. So when I went to Exxon, I had the choice of Exxon or Cornell, and I chose Exxon at that time. Today, all those corporate labs have gone. So the research you'll do in industry these days is much more focused, much more short term. So today, I would say if you want to do fundamental research, academia is the place to do it. So things have totally switched around. It may switch back. And if we want to compete with the Asians, we're going to have to do more basic research and applied research in industry and, and do it for the long term, not, not just for the next quarter's report on Wall Street. So speaking of research, we have a question that uh, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to overcome after presenting a defensible hypothesis and obtaining controversial results? Ask that question again. I know they're putting us on the spot. Uh, what is the biggest obstacle to overcome, do you think, after presenting a defensible hypothesis and then obtaining controversial results? What we would do is present it to your colleagues. So if your students sit down with the other students and get their advice, but this is now not uncommon. You have a hypothesis and the results don't quite fit it. So you may have to modify your hypothesis, but sit down with a group and go through it. Now we have group meetings in my group two days every week. So students will get up, present what they've got, what they think it means, and other students say, maybe it's not quite that. So uh, Stan, we have a question here as well um, about your, your life at Binghamton and how, um, how you teach your classes. So do you teach undergraduate classes? And you know, what kind of classes do you teach? And what opportunities are available for undergraduates to take some of those classes, if at all? OK, so I used to teach um, Chemistry 111 which is a one semester chemistry course that science majors and all the engineers take. I taught that from about 19, I'm going to say 88, 89, when I had 30 students. And when I stopped teaching that, I had 400 students in it. Um, right now I teach a few specialized classes here and there, which are then, uh, can I say, plopped into other classes. So I don't teach any regular you know, three day a week classes anymore because of my research activities. But I you know, teach graduate students. We have, a, as I say, um, the freshman research initiative. So I'm involved with that. And we're always open for undergraduates to come and talk to us. And my graduate students are always excited to talk to undergraduates and explain what we're doing and try to get them interested. Thank you, Stan. Um, so speaking of getting them interested, we have a question. Uh, is there a best major that you would suggest to get involved in renewable energy and batteries at Binghamton? Oh, I think a, a number of majors just depend whether you want to um, be a scientist or get into policy and things like that. Certainly in chemistry, we have a major which is a BS in chemistry with an emphasis in materials. Um, physics has a similar major. Um, then there's also, also environmental sciences that will get you into that. Um, in engineering, there's such a heavy load of courses that I think there are, there are very few in the energy and environmental area that there's a possibility of slipping one or two of them in there. So I say mainstream uh, chemistry and physics, and uh, if there are pre-med students listening, I strongly suggest you want to get into med school, do not take biology. 
take chemistry, physics, or what one or two of my advisees have done. One was a classics major and the other one did comparative literature. And if they got good grades, they're guaranteed to get to medical school because they're so different to all the other applicants. Thank you, Stan. Uh, so speaking of, of medical uh, field and, you know, pre-health you mentioned, um, we might transition back to some of those uh, battery questions, but uh, one of our students wanted to ask, what is the use of lithium or the lithium-ion batteries in the medical field today? So lithium batteries are used in all implantable devices. So they're within all, all your pacemakers, whether they're the inert pacemakers, or the pacemakers that will give you a big zap to get your heart going again. Um, they're in most of the sensors that might be on your body to sense what's going on. And clearly if you've got a Apple watch or something else, which is taking medical measurements, that's a lithium battery there. So there's research going on within electrical engineering and mechanical engineering to actually develop more smart patches to put on your body so it can monitor you the entire time. If so, if you're coming off a heart attack, it can keep your doctor informed in real time as to how you're doing. So they're getting more and more involved and they need to be flexible. So there's a lot of research going there. And obviously it's um, high end and the cost is not really an issue there. Reliability and safety is the big issue. Thanks, Stan. And then, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll transition back to the vehicles. You mentioned those uh, garbage trucks and some of those vehicles becoming electric. So when do you see those bigger vehicles becoming available to the public? And uh, what other safety measures do you see for vehicles beyond that Tesla that you mentioned? So the, the, the big truck I showed you, that, that one I understand is now in um, Los Angeles docks, is taking the big um, containers from the docks to distribution points. Um, the garbage trucks in service somewhere, so they're testing it out in real applications. Um, there are already all electric buses in certain cities. And some of you may know that BAE Systems makes hybrid buses and a large proportion of the Broome County fleet are hybrid buses which are made by BAE Systems. And it's my understanding that Broome County has the highest proportion of a hybrid electric vehicles of any city within New York State. Wonderful. Um, so we have, uh, this is maybe a, a different sort of question, but maybe it learns a little bit more about you. Uh, so who is your favorite scientist that you've worked with? Oh, I've worked with plenty of them. So my initial scientists I worked with were in high school. They were the ones who got me all excited about science. Then I worked with um, Peter Dickens at Oxford. He was a great mentor. So at Oxford, you don't have quizzes every week. You have a tutorial once a week. So I'd sit down with him for one hour each week and we'd discuss science. I'd write a paper, then we'd discuss it. And then clearly at, at Stanford also, um, Bob Huggins helped me a lot. I had advantage in both places. So at Oxford, my Peter left for a year sabbatical, so I was left alone. At Stanford, Bob Huggins went to Washington for two years, and I basically ran his group for two years. So those were great experiences. So I don't believe in treating students like technicians. I want them to develop their own program and then um, run with it. Thanks, Dan. So you kind of answered this next question about how you became interested in science. How did you become interested specifically in the lithium batteries? Okay, so w when I went to from Oxford to Stanford, um, folks at the Ford Motor Company had just, just found out that um, ions can move very fast in some solids. So Ford Motor Company was thinking of making a sodium sulfur battery. In the end, it didn't work out. I think GE picked it up and then dropped it totally about four or five years ago. It operated at 300 degrees centigrade. We studied that material and pretty quickly came to the conclusion we need to operate at room temperature 
And I understood, shall I say, the solid state chemistry of materials and how we could make chemical reactions go fast. So at um, Exxon, they were interested when I went there in everything except oil and chemicals. So we started working on batteries and their specific interest was electric vehicles. Exxon was talking about getting into the electric vehicle business. So at the moment, are you still doing research to improve the efficiency of the lithium ion batteries or are you planning to develop a whole new type of battery? You mentioned the solid state batteries earlier. Or, you know, what, what kind of direction are you headed in now? We're still basically working on lithium batteries. Most of our efforts there. Um, the other sort of batteries like solid state, we do a little bit of work there, but they're going, not going to come into being until the 2030s. Um, we work with this large consortium out of Pacific Northwest National Lab in Washington. So we're now trying to go back to lithium batteries, not lithium iron. So that means we use pure lithium and we get rid of the graphite that presently holds the lithium. So we're almost circling back to where we were 45 years ago. Interesting. Uh, so one more question about you before we kind of wrap up. I've got a, a good wrap up question here. Um, so who inspires you that is not a scientist? I, I would say my family, my wife. She keeps encouraging me on. Despite me, um, me disappearing for part of the time. And my wife teaches um, Spanish, Latin American literature at Oswego State. So she's busy up there teaching languages remotely at the moment and getting ready for their exams, which is not easy in languages when you have to do it remotely. So she's that's, inspired me, kept me going, and my two children have done the same thing. That's and, wonderful. And when I got the Nobel Prize, it was one of my grandsons who was the first one to find out about it. Wow. Had you ever thought that you would win a Nobel Prize? Well, you probably know this. We got this um, laureate announcement in 2015 that John Goodenough and I were the favorites. So the university planned everything for that year and subsequent years. Last October, they did nothing. I think the president was out of town. I was in Germany. So when you don't plan, it happens. That's but right. That's right. So I think we'll end with this question now. I think this may be one of our current students who is on. Um, there's a student here saying that they've read your entire publication from 2004 on lithium batteries and cathode materials and the building process of learning at Binghamton University helped with the student's ability to parse through the language. So I think that's a really great compliment to, of course, your work and, and your connection that you make with the students. Um, so we'll, we'll end with this. How does it feel to be a part of Binghamton and that community and being able to teach and work with this future generation of researchers? So the main reason I left industry, because everybody in industry grows old together. Coming to academia, you get a fresh batch of 18-year-olds coming in every year. So they keep you young, their minds are enthusiastic. You know, they're still excited about everything. And Binghamton's a great area. I live in Vestal. I live four miles from the university. And I've got 20 plus acres which I can roam around. So in these times of the virus, I've met, I think, more people on my street than I have in the last 10 years. But I can also keep good distance from people. It's a it's a great area. People are very collaborative on campus. There are not fiefdoms like you see in some other universities. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stan, for coming on. We really appreciate you taking, taking the time. Um, I, I hope a lot of students have been able to get their questions answered and, and others who have joined us. So we just want to thank you again. And I, I certainly uh, think this was very informative and I hope our students have gotten, gotten a lot out of it. So um, thanks again, Stan, for coming on. Thank you all, and I hope to see some of you in September. Yes, we do. We, we do very much. So thank you all for joining us. We hope you have a great, great day and a great week, and uh, we'll hope to see everyone again soon. Bye-bye, Stan. Thanks again. Bye.